Estoy encantado para conocerte poco. Um, I'm going to speak in English because otherwise I'll take too much time. Um, when I want to speak to you about uh, how we're changing our production systems um, and also I want to start with a confession. For me, uh, I've, I've been an entrepreneur for a, a while, about almost uh, 18 years. And um, in 2007, I looked at my career and decided that uh, I considered myself an environmentalist and an entrepreneur. As an entrepreneur, uh, I noticed that I became very good at uh, observing systems and failure. I also uh, gave myself a B. I've had some, some interesting talent around. Uh, we were able to do some really great companies. We learned a lot. It was quite good. As an, as an environmentalist, I failed. Um, and it was this that actually caused me to start thinking about several things that led me to the sharing economy and also um, this whole other idea, which I call a social operating system. Because I became an entrepreneur because, not because I necessarily thought it was the best way to make money, although, um, you know, that's one thing, certainly, that's, that's an outcome. But for me, it had a lot more to do of changing the world around us. And so, for me, the social operating system, or social OS, is this idea that invisible to us, just like in a computer there's an operating system, around us there's an operating system. It shapes what we think is possible for us, who we think we can speak to, uh, what, what's available, what's on offer. And that social operating system is embedded into software, institutions, and practices. For example, um, if we think about who remembers last century, the 20th century, uh, yeah, so I refer to that as the century of the generals. It was General Motors, General Mills, General Electric, General Dynamics, top-down, one-to-many, hey, you know what, I'm the one with the machines, you work for me. Very bossy, very much following the military model, but you know what, the social OS is changing, and it's changing rapidly, and it's really shaping the world around us in ways that are very fundamental to us as business people, entrepreneurs, designers, people designing cities. So this century, the 21st century, has a different rhythm, different tools, challenges, opportunities. It, it actually sets up for a whole new way of thinking. In addition, we know that um, we have more things and connections to each other than we've ever had on the planet before. Uh, we can see here, for example, in 20, 2006, there were two billion connected things. In 2020, we're expecting 200 billion connected things. So more things will be connected than not connected. In other words, it will be hard to not share. It will be hard to not know where things are and what's available at different moments. This is a, um, a chart that uh, basically says, right now, how many people here are running around with one or more smartphones? Okay, all of us. Um, this becomes the remote control for our life. And, and so what's happened since 1971 is $900,000 worth of value in terms of capability is sitting on our smartphones, encyclopedias, pho photography, mapping applications, medical and health applications, an amazing array of things has now become table stakes, is now what everyone expects, and it's free. So as we think about the speed and what's available to us and what's already around us as being distributed, when we started a company called Ophoto in 1999, we raised $60 million. We sold the company to Kodak. We ran digital photography in Kodak. 
In 2007, when I looked at if I was going to start a photo seven or eight years later, what would it take? Any guesses what percent of the $60 million? Three to five percent. So we have so many assets distributed that we're moving rapidly from last century's prevailing model, which was one of ownership, to a world in which access to talent, goods, and services, access trumps ownership. Not always, but often. This is a map from a company called Mapbox. It's a satellite image of the world. And what it's showing is 900 million Wi-Fi boxes. Now, I show this to you for two reasons. One, we're more connected than ever before. We're always connected through Wi-Fi, etc. But also, what this does is it shows you one of the fundamental elements of what's making la, la economia collaborativa, or the sharing economy, grow so quickly and, and change the way fundamental business models are being shaped. We are making things that were invisible before very visible. And in the moment that we do that, we make it possible for someone else to access it. One of the core tenets of the MESH, or the La Economia Collaborativa, is this, that value are things that we, things we value in the moment that they're not being used, they're wasted. And with this new visibility, we can tap into momentary access for homes, offices, houses, talent, support for money from the crowd. Many, many things become possible. Everybody here, I'm sure, has heard not only today, but before today about Airbnb. I bring it up for a couple of reasons. Uh, one, it's a great example of a two-sided marketplace where supply and demand are from peers, not from companies. And what we see when we look at Airbnb against the world's largest hotel chain, the Intercontinental Hotel, is that in 11% of the time, in seven years, Airbnb has more than twice as many rooms and has created more than two times the value. And that's interesting, but I, I want to show you something else, which is when the World Cup comes to town or when there's a, a, a storm and people can't be in their homes and they need new, new sudden availability of a place to stay, when demand jumps, these models the model of two-sided marketplace is much more resilient, much more capable. And because we're living in a world where so much changes so quickly, resilience is a massive benefit. These, these models also are getting mature enough that we're seeing ecosystems around them. So companies like Zalvers in, in DFA in Mexico City uh, are providing people who clean Airbnb rooms so that you don't have to. In addition, we see that expectations are changing so quickly. Uber, another sharing economy company, is basically uh, showing us here that they auto-disrupt on a regular basis. They are constantly looking for what's next. And in this case, this shows that they launched in 2013 in Los Angeles. When they started, people were willing to wait eight minutes for a car. One year later, people were only willing to wait four minutes. So there's a constant, the, the people who are on the demand side of the economy, choices, uh, they're able to be very demanding. They're a, they're, they are able to create the kind of tension that forces us as entrepreneurs and business people to continuously innovate. Therefore, you know, diversity and resilience are completely related here. The more diverse we have, like these two-sided platforms are brilliant for creating diversity. All the homes are different than each other. The drivers have different stories. They actually have different kinds of cars. These things, the, the reach of this is very diverse, but it also creates a kind of resilience that we can't find in these other models. And so, one of the other things by way of confession that I'm, 
I'm very impressed from 2009 when I wrote the book, uh, the, La Maya in Castellano, what, um, how quickly the sharing economy has grown. But one of the things that's dis disappointing for me is we see that there's been $125 billion of market value built in these companies to date. However, what's happening is from the social operating system perspective, these companies like Airbnb and TaskRabbit, Wallapop, um, Blah Blah Car, they have been funded by venture capitalists. And while the business model is the 21st century, the business capture, the way that value is being created is diverse, the way it's being captured is still by the investors and the founders. And I say this being an investor, but I, I'm, I, the, the model hasn't already all, all the way shifted, and we're starting to see the social OS changing deeply. Um, what we're, we're heading, I think, is where we start to see the relationship between how value is created, very diverse, and how value is captured, reaching a balance. In a way, the, the, the drawing on your left, the ego, is very much the social OS of last century. Top-down, benefits to the few. And on the, on the left side, or sorry, on your right side, uh, we have something that's an ecosystem. There's no top, there's no center, there's no bottom. At the moment, there is a center, and the center is the platform. The other piece that has happened and how the social OS is also being addressed here is that over the last five or six years, we've seen in, that there's been a massive shift in the way that people around the world trust brands, and particularly tr don't trust brands, especially in the industry of uh, energy and banking. And so, and probably in some cases for good reason. So we know that we're, we've moved in a way from trusting in banks to trusting in brands. You know, brands were our proxies for trust. And we're moving very rapidly into a new social operating system where we're being at the edge of truly trusting each other. In, the, in this, these kinds of models and in the social OS, as in many markets and many, much of the economy, trust is primary. One of the things that's emerging that I want to mention to you, but is the topic of maybe conversation over lunch or something else, is um, how many people have heard of blockchain or Bitcoin? Okay. Blockchain is an emerging, I won't say technology, but it's a framework for allowing us to think about how we can create immediate smart contracts between people so that we can trust each other and so that we can distribute value. When I take an idea of yours and incorporate it into a, a piece of music or a, a product that we build, you receive credit in whatever form. These core concepts are being tested and rapidly adopted, for example, by banks, BBVA, uh, Barclays, uh, HSBC, Citi. All of the banks are rapidly testing this because they realize that trust is core, obviously, for finance. And so something is disrupting, even at the trust level. Uh, I would invite all of you to, to just perk up your ears when you start to hear about blockchain, because blockchain will allow us to create the new social OS. The missing piece of the puzzle from my perspective is how is it that we're going to be able to truly trust each other on a regular basis without having a platform in the middle? And for me, there's a promise, a, a hopeful promise, that uh, blockchain can provide a lot of those solutions. So in thinking about how you start or what there is to do about any of this, um, the first thing is, how many people here consider themselves optimists? Okay, impresionante. <laughs> so my view is, if, you're, if you are not optimistic, 
It's impossible to invent the future. You can't innovate unless you're optimistic. Because if you, if you think about it, if you, if you think that your best days are behind you and you're holding on to the past, it's really effectively impossible to truly get excited and imagine the future. So that's the first thing, is begin to observe how you feel, what mood you bring to the conversation, and also the kind of people you surround yourself with in the moment of innovation. The second thing is, I'll, I'll tell you the Antonio Banderas version, but you can put in whoever it is you like. Um, in, in Hollywood, when they make a film, you know, they do like take 22, okay, no, take 47, pff, no, todavía, okay, 107. And finally, we sit in the film, we sit and watch the movie, and we think, wow, que lindo, pero also we say, wow, Antonio Banderas, Selma Hayek, wow, these people were amazing. We don't say, oh my God, I can't believe that it took 107 takes. Just like in our businesses and just like in our lives, I would invite you to start to think about these as mistakes, as simply experiences that are bringing us to the final amazing result. Because again, in innovation, unless you're willing to make these mistakes, nothing good can happen. The third thing is we have to be open. In, in, um, in Silicon Valley, a lot of the conversation that people have is uh, you know, the, the best people to work on your particular challenge most likely don't work for you. And now that more and more people are floating around as freelance talent or moving quickly between companies or platforms, I would add, maybe they don't work for you today, but also they may never work for you. And so how do you find them and how do you seduce them to work with you to solve real challenges. Stay open. You might be surprised who brings the solution to you or from where they come. And so I, I just offer that. There are increasing numbers of platforms. We've talked here already about companies like Airbnb and Uber. Other people mentioned a couple other ones earlier today. I think that um, transportation and lodging, tourism, um, those are areas that we've been seeing a lot. With Wallapop, we know that things can be recycled quickly or upcycled to each other and shared. But there's also these platforms for co-creation that have a lot of um, power and potency. For example, if people here actually are makers in terms of making things like cars or machines, uh, those sorts of things. Local Motors, I would direct you to as an example, but it's a brilliant uh, platform for creating and co-creating uh, across a global community of people uh, really amazing things in what they call micro-manufacturing. But the interesting thing from my perspective, it w as it relates to thinking newly about production and sharing, is that uh, this structure allows us to participate together and create something that better for having come together. Um, I, m many of you, I'm sure, have spent some time in meetings, I'm guessing. Uh, most of them, at least from my perspective, are ha I'm happy to zoom past. Uh, I would encourage you to often cut the meeting short and make something. Build it, test it, get into market and learn because you're never going to really figure out how to perfectly do something until you engage with the audience, the market. So prototypes for me, uh, and especially in the world that we're living in when there's so much change, is absolutely essential. We see big companies doing this. We saw Waira from Telefonica earlier, uh, Unilever, Barclays. Here, as an example of Disney, offering a platform inviting inventors, entrepreneurs, uh, technologists, mentors, to participate with them and to use their brand assets. It helps Disney discover innovation and it provides real leverage and potential scale for, for micro uh, businesses and in incredible talent. I, as an investor, look for this, which is how many people here consider themselves an um, early adopter? 
maybe I should tell you, my definition of early adopter is people who pay too much for things that don't work. <laughs> so that's definitely me. Uh, by the laugh, I'm guessing I have friends in the audience. So value is greater than effort. In the moment that the value exceeds the effort, you now have a product or a movement or a class of product or a business that is now ready to really refine and scale. Before that, when in the effort is bigger than the value, as an investor, for example, that's something I pay attention to so that you know where you are in the cycle. And then, for me, with respect to the social OS, and if we think back to some of the conversations we've had earlier about machine-to-machine -machine learning and algorithms, um, artificial intelligence, robots, and even just what happened with Volkswagen, where they creatively uh, design software that cheats uh, on a test, um, I think it's important for us, increasingly, to ask the question of who is designing our social OS, because it shapes the world around us, and it's sneaky, it's invisible. In many cases, the answer to that question could be a bunch of really young guys in Palo Alto. And for that, I'm just, I'm just raising an alarm. <laughs> Um, and so I think it's a good question to ask if you're running a business, thinking about communities, or just as a, as a customer. In closing, I, I want to say that when I think about what's happening to us in the world, from a social OS perspective, a business perspective, and just the way that we live in the world towards access, I'm always reminded of this uh, expression, Spanish expression, estamos juntos, pero no revueltos. And I just want to tell you, we're heading towards revueltos. <laughs> so more and more data, the conversations, the things, the engagement, the connections, it's changing. In closing, I want to just take a, 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 I'll let you vote on the ending. So this is one possible quote, which I'm very fond of. Si quieren ir rapidamente, vaya sola. Si quieren, le si quieren ir lejos, vayan juntos. O, quisieran enterramos, pero se les olvidó que somos semillas. Okay. Ambos, it's possible that both of them, I think, are, are, are appropriate. Uh, for me, they, they fit perfectly the moment that we're living in, and, um, and I, I hope that it gives all of us an, an incredible path to the future. I think um, f we, are, we are certainly connected and the opportunity to create something potent and rather beautiful together is right before us. So thank you very much. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you. Alguna pregunta? Si veo alguna mano por ahí. Por favor, micrófono. Mira aquí. Yeah. Hi, Lisa. Great talk. Peter Evans, by the way. Hey, hi, Peter. Hey. Um, I'm really interested in your views on the kind of health care. Um, a lot of your examples are in transportation and uh, travel and things, but we're seeing uh, a number of uh, startups pop up in the medical field, and I wonder how, with your concept of the social OS, and some of the challenges, some people would say, broken healthcare system, how that may fit in and how you think about uh, potential for some of the concepts you laid out in the healthcare field. That's a great question. Thank you. Nice to see you. Do you want to, does everybody, did everybody hear the question? Uh, it was basically, my examples had, were in different sectors, and Peter has the question, how does healthcare benefit or be challenged by these models. And um, from my perspective, I think that uh, healthcare is, is essentially, um, we think about it as ourselves, like my personal health. And I think increasingly what these models are doing is creating a sense of uh, community connections. So we're starting to see, both with technology and with social OS, 
um, especially, for example, in, in Western Europe, where people are, the, the population, and in Japan, where the populations are already older, we're looking at how do we reduce the financial consequences at the, at the state or country level, but also how do we create a better life for and more connectivity, like human touch, uh, between older people who have a lot to teach us and younger people who have a lot of energy, right? So my joke about it is like when I was a, a young entrepreneur, we used to say, um, the expression was OPM, other people's money. And that's, you had all the energy and the ideas, you're looking for o OPM. When, when you're older, you, you have the money and some of the ideas, but you, what you really want to leverage is other people's talent and energy. So it's the OPB, other people's bodies. And I think a lot of times, this also plays with, um, with healthcare. We're seeing many different examples, and I think the technology is, is bringing the connection of these, like TaskRabbit or other groups of people. There was uh, the gentleman from Razorfish gave a really good example, I thought, from the, the partnership between Apple and the Japan Post. Uh, so we're seeing those kinds of touch points being, being um, made cheaper and more frequent by technology, but I think the human uh, awareness and capacity is, is what's really uh, exciting to me. Thank you for the question. Más preguntas? Any more no? questions? I have a question, Lisa. Okay. Um, you mentioned, okay, people don't trust in brands, people don't trust in, in companies, people don't trust in politicians. But what about the other way around? I mean, politicians, lawmakers, regulators, do they trust in people? People as creators, people as, ah. as producers, people as makers and, and part of an active, a new economy? Yeah. Are they, are they trusting in people? Are they really, I mean, the lawmakers, the people who, who are changing things, you know, has to, have to change things? Yes. I think, thank you for the question. Um, the, I think the fact that when we see things like Airbnb and Lyft and Social Car and Wallapop and these sorts of things uh, growing at the rate that they're growing, we realize that the social OS is in fact changing and that we're, we don't yet have, in fact there's a Spanish company in Madrid that's called Treaty that's working on reputation that doesn't only live on the platform like Airbnb. But I think one of the things that we're really struggling with as like a global community is how is it that we're going to be able to really trust each other from far away? Because so far, you know, there have been very little, very few instances that have gone bad with the Economia Collaborativa or and your experience, I'm sure, in, in share, sharing Spain. Share Spain. Yes. <laughs> and, and so I think the, up until now, uh, these, these platforms have worked very well. I think that for me, um, as they expand, and also one of the other things that's happening is large companies are creating partnerships so that they can bring some things to the table as well, which is in, an interesting twist. But I think um, the opportunity really also that I've been looking at is blockchain allows for us to have our reputations kind of in a public safe place that's, that's um, certified, let's say, uh, so that we can actually see who says what about you and are you really that guy. Um, and I think increasingly that, that sort of technology, that's part of the reason that I'm particularly enthusiastic about blockchain is up until now a lot of the potency and a lot of the value of the platforms, Airbnb, Uber, etc., have been in the fact that they control the supply side of the marketplace, that they can say that this house really exists, it's really in Costa Brava, it, it has these many bedrooms, and it's really clean. Uh, but, if, but if that person decides to offer their house on a different platform, they, their reputation is, is, is held inside of Airbnb. And so I think that that's a, a point of friction. Okay. The other thing that's interesting um, is what will the role of insurance be? And so, for example, 
would you have to get insurance to say that in fact you have these talents or that you're co you know covered for certain things so i think that that when we, we were talking a little earlier about regulations we're living because the social os is is very fluid right now uh, regulations are lagging and some of the business models for related companies like banks and insurance are also obviously lagging so so far you know Thankfully, uh, a lot of these platforms have made people feel very positive because the platform has allowed for us to learn about each other and trust each other on a very specific transaction. Um, and so I think that has been a lot of the potency for the growth uh, for the last five or six years. Thank you. Okay, Lisa, thank you very much. Thank Thanks you very coming. much. a social operating system. Because I became an entrepreneur because, not because I necessarily thought it was the best way to make money, although um, you know, that's one thing certainly that's, that's an outcome, but for me, it had a lot more to do of changing the world around us. And so for me, the social operating system or social OS is this idea that invisible to us, just like in a computer there's an operating system, around us there's an operating system. It shapes what we think is possible for us, who we think we can speak to, uh, what, what's available, what's on offer. And that social operating system is embedded into software, institutions, and practices. For example, um, if we think about who remembers last century, the 20th century, uh, yeah, so I refer to that as the century of the generals. It was General Motors, General Mills, General Electric, General Dynamics, top-down, one-to-many, hey, you know what, I'm the one with the machines, you work for me. Very bossy, very much following the military model, but you know what, the social OS, is changing, and it's changing rapidly, and it's really shaping the world around us in ways that are very fundamental to us as business people, entrepreneurs, designers, people designing cities. So this century, the 21st century, has a different rhythm, different tools, challenges, opportunities. It, it actually sets up for a whole new way of thinking. In addition, we know that um, we have more things and connections to each other than we've ever had on the planet before. I considered myself an environmentalist and an entrepreneur. As an entrepreneur, uh, I noticed that I became very good at uh, observing systems and failure. I also uh, gave myself a B. I've had some, some interesting talent around. Uh, we were able to do some really great companies. We learned a lot. It was quite good. As an, as an environmentalist, I failed. Um, and it was this that actually caused me to start thinking about several things that led me to the sharing economy and also um, this whole other idea, which I call... Estoy encantado para conocerte poco. I'm going to speak in English because... Otherwise, I'll take too much time. Um, when I want to speak to you about uh, how we're changing our production systems, um, and also I want to start with a confession. For me, uh, I've, I've been an entrepreneur for a, a while, about almost uh, 18 years. And um, in 2007, I looked at my career and decided that uh, I can 